Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, the next installment of Kiskit Circuit Sessions. I'm Kevin Kersulich. I am a member of the Quantum Software Group at IBM's TJ Watson Research Center uh, in Yorktown Heights, New York. Uh, today, we're going to be talking a little bit about transpiling quantum circuits. Uh, but before we get started, we'll take, uh, take a couple of minutes, let everybody uh, join the link. Uh, folks are in the, the YouTube channel. I uh, want to say hi, give a, a quick uh, shout out from where they're from, maybe what, what, what field they work in, and uh, maybe le what level of uh, familiarity they have with, with the whole notion of, of transpiling circuits. Maybe you've never heard of it before, or maybe you're, maybe you're an expert. Awesome, Toronto, Belfast, Romania. <laughs> and, uh, under a sunny palm tree in Florida, sounds sounds nice. Montpellier, very nice, Lake Tahoe. Warsaw, Qatar, Ithaca, very cool. Uh, and just a reminder for, for folks who are, who are joining the channel, um, that today is, uh, I think, day three of the IBM Quantum Experience's uh, fourth birthday celebration. Uh, it was you know, four years ago that, that uh, IBM first put the, uh, the first public access quantum computers on the crowd, and there's a, a series of challenges going on uh, on the uh, IQX. Uh, so I think today's challenge is uh, around the BB84 protocol. Uh, so if you have an opportunity to, to, to stop in and, and take a look at that, I think it's uh, they're really exciting, really uh, really thoughtful and educational series of of challenges. So let's see, Poland, Belgium, Montreal, India, fantastic. Yeah, and quick reminder for folks who are who are joining and watching the the stream. If you have an opportunity to to subscribe to the Kiska channel, this is uh, one of a, a handful of ongoing seminar series that we have right now. Uh, and subscribing is a great way to to keep on top of of uh, of all the uh, the events that we've got. All right, so we're just approaching five past, uh, so we'll uh, just about get started. Give folks maybe one more minute to join in. Okay, so uh, it's five past, so we'll, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm Kevin Kersulich. I'm a member of the Quantum Software Group at IBM's uh, TJ Washington Research Center in Yorktown Heights, New York. Uh, and today in the, the next installment of Kiskit Circuit Sessions, uh, we're gonna be talking a bit about uh, transpiling quantum circuits. Um, uh, if you have questions during the during the stream, uh, feel free to post them in the in the YouTube channel. I'll try and keep an eye on them as we go. And and uh, for sort of more general questions or questions that I miss, uh, we'll we'll try and leave some time at the end. Um, so you know, back in the the an earlier edition of of the circuit sections, uh, Jay I think posted uh, uh, this sort of graphic that you know lays out what you know all the possible implementation are. Uh, understandings of, of, of what folks can mean when they say a, a quantum circuit you know is it something you know more on the left hand side that's you know very abstract maybe uh, uh, it has a, a concrete definition uh, logically in terms of what the circuit's trying to implement um, but you know it's not exactly clear how that would make its way to a device you know and then on the right hand side it's it's we have a, a description of a quantum circuit that you know it's very clear how you'd implement that in a device but it's, it's a little bit less clear what the the logical implementation or, or the, the the problem that that circuit is trying to solve 
Um, so, you know, when I look at, at, at this particular graphic, the thing that stands out to me is that, you know, the, the end goal for all of these, uh, all of these implementations uh, would be to, to reach execution on their device, right? If we want to see some advantage from quantum computing, computing you know, in most cases, we're going to want to execute these things on an actual device. So we're going to need some process for, for moving between these, right? From taking, you know, an abstract description of a, a theoretical circuit and preparing it for uh, execution on a, on a real quantum computer. Um, and yeah, so quantum, you know, quantum circuit is a language for describing a problem or an algorithm. You know, they can be very uh, abstract. They can be uh, written in a way that's agnostic to what device they'll eventually be executed on, um, or they can be written in a very specific way that's that's tailored to um, the particular gates that are available on a device or or some other properties of a device. Um, but to some degree, right? If they're if they're going to be executed, then then there has to be some resolution of uh, of that abstractness, right? The devices that we have today come with come with practical constraints. There are you know a limited number of calibrated gates. There's a finite degree of connectivity between the two qubit gates, um, and moreover, they they come with uh, with very specific and, and detailed and well documented uh, noise and, and decoherence and error characteristics. Um, that maybe we, we we want to compensate for. Maybe we want to to try and and uh, and and take advantage of to some degree. So that's where where we see this this problem of of transpiling quantum circuits coming in, right? For any given logical circuit, uh, there's going to be a handful of ways that that could be in, uh, implemented or executed on a given device. Uh, when we transpile, we want to try and find that that one implementation um, which executes the the logical circuit on the device and best takes advantage of, of the capabilities of that device, the qubits that it has, the gates that it has, uh, while minimizing loss uh, due to noise and decoherence. And you know, there's a couple of, of key benefits to having this kind of approach where we, we, where we write in a, a high level language and, and look to transpile down to something that's executable. Uh, it gives a point of, of consolidation, right? Uh, in the field uh, in which we work, the pace of development in, in terms of hardware and, and control and compilation techniques is, is very rapid. Um, having a, a single point of, of consolidation where new ideas can can come to come to be tested, be be integrated, um, makes it really a, a, a very fruitful way to drive forward the industry, uh, because you know you don't have to necessarily be an expert on compilation techniques to get the most efficient um, implementation of, of your algorithm running on a device. Um, and likewise, you know, when there are shifts in hardware, where when a new uh, hardware revision comes out, or the device has been recalibrated, so the, the gate times are slightly differently, you know, all of these things can be sort of uh, very quickly and very efficiently taken advantage of um, in an automated way by by the process of transpiling. Um, and then, sort of from a from a motivational standpoint, you know, why is why is transpiling an an important problem? Um, first, I would say, you know, that you know. We, you know, when you look at the the big counter of how many circuits have been executed on on the IQX, you know every circuit that's passed to to the execute function in Qiskit goes through the transpiler. So you know, with with the occasional exception, um, right? So it's a it's a very impactful problem, um, and it's also at the same time it's a great area for getting started. Right? There's a lot of open problems, uh, and it's an active area of research in, in several fields. So sort of wherever you're coming from, whatever your background is. Um, it's uh, it's a great place to to get started to learn about sort of what's what's new, what's developing in quantum computing, and, and potentially where you can uh, you know look to make an impact to, to have a, a contribution. And so the goal for today is we're going to take an opportunity to review some of the the techniques that are available for transpiling quantum circuits. Um, you know we'll look at a little bit more depth the uh, the problem that transpiling solves. Uh, the set of tools that are available in Qiskit uh, for for solving that particular problem, and then how best to to employ them, how to suit them for you know your particular experiment, your your application or use case. Somebody who you know had never heard of the transpiler before, the process of transpilation. Um, then you know we hope to answer the question you know when and and why and in you know in what context will the circuits that run on the the device look different from you know the circuit that you constructed in Qiskit. You know, they should be logically equivalent, but you know, they may differ in uh, in their performance. Uh, and so it's important to know when that's going to be the case. Um, and likewise to know when the transpiler will be able to actually help you get more uh, performance out of your device and, and in what cases it won't be able to. Uh, for folks who have used the transpiler before who are a little bit more familiar, um, there'll be a, a review of sort of 
how best to, to take advantage of the power that's there, how what configuration options are available that may help you to enable certain passes. Um, and additionally, how to, how to monitor and inspect the transpiler to know sort of what choices it's making and why and how it arrived at that final output, output circuit. Um, and then the last, the, last, uh, the last group, folks who are maybe a little bit more uh, uh, aware and knowledgeable on the transpiler, uh, you know, we'll talk about sort of what are the available optimization passes, how to, you know, how to, how to put them together to get the maximum uh, performance from your device, um, and then how to specifically control what stages the other transpiler will execute to give a greater degree of control on, you know, what your output circuit ultimately looks like. Um, so in, uh, you know, in the, the beginning, we mentioned that we start with an abstract quantum circuit. Right, which is this portable model of, of quantum computation, um, which you know it, it it it's a it's a benefit, it's a feature, right? We we like the fact that it gives the ability for writing a high level algorithm, having that algorithm be uh, composable, be you know allow for some level of computational abstraction, and then additionally be portable to to execute on different devices. Say if you want to compare uh, between you know any of the handful of of IBM devices that are available, or maybe uh, compare across architectures, see how uh, a given algorithm executes uh, when compiled for a superconducting device versus an ion trap device. Um, and so th this is a feature that we very much like to have, um, but it requires that these, these circuits be uh, converted before they, they end up going to the device. Right, so just as a quick example, right, if I look at a, a three qubit GAZ state and I build it in QuizKit, you know, more or less the way that, it, that I would expect it to look from you know, reading any quantum compu uh, computation textbook. You know, I'd, I'd uh, have a Hadamard on my first qubit and two CX gates, right? So with a Hadamard, I, I build an equal superposition of the zero and one states. And with the two CX gates, I sort of spread that entanglement to my other two qubits, right? So I'd expect that when I take my measurements, I end up with an equal superposition of the zero, 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 and one, one, one state. <clears throat> and, you know, I argue that, that that's a well-formed circuit, right? That that's a, that's a valid quantum circuit. And when I go to execute it on Air's CHASM simulator, uh, this is this is more or less what I see. I, I can, you know, execute my device, uh, execute my circuit. I can get the counts back. I get back the even mixture or the even superposition of the zero, 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 and one, one, one states. Um, and you know, note that I've I've taken a bit of a sidestep from the usual uh, qiskit.execute pathway. Uh, I've taken that circuit and I've directly converted it into the wire format that I can send to the back end. Right. And when I do that, Air Air is able to process that just fine. Uh, but when I do the same with uh, a hardware device, in this instance, Vigo, um, I assemble it just the same and I, I run it just the same. But it, in this case, I get back an error. It says, oh, well, H is, is not among the basis gates. And I say, okay, well, that's, that's a little bit confusing. I, I guess I, maybe I wouldn't have expected that. What happens if I take away, you know, H is probably the Hadamard gate. What if I take out the Hadamard gate? And I've got a, a 2CX circuit. It's not super interesting from a practical standpoint, right? It, I'd expect just zeros on the counts, but we'll see if we can execute it all the same. Um, and in this case, I still I get back a different error message. It says uh, the circuit includes an instruction that assumes a coupling map different than than the specified coupling map. And so, okay, that's that's a little surprising too. Or I, I, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something. Um, and in fact, yeah, the 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 thing that I'm missing when I'm when I'm going through these examples is that the quantum circuits that I build, you know, they allow me to abstract to to a degree over what my device looks like. So while Vigo has five qubits, they it doesn't necessarily have uh, the qubits uh, arranged in, in, a, in an all-to-all -all connectivity like I would expect when I'm, when I'm building an abstract circuit, right? So if I want to run a CX gate between qubit zero and qubit one, uh, you know, Vigo is, is, uh, is, is prepared, has a gate that will allow me to do that. Um, but if I want to run a CX gate between qubit zero and qubits two, um, then Vigo has no, no gate that allows me to do that, right? So that's, that's why I get an error. And so, this is where we 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 stake the first of of two goals for circuit transpilation, right? We want to be able to transform a given quantum circuit into one which takes into account the available features of a given backend um, and converts it into a circuit which is executable on that backend while preserving measurement outcomes. Um, and then additionally, it takes the opportunity to you know, given this breadth of information that we have about the device resources are and what its uh, noise characteristics are, that optimizes it to be. Uh, uh, an efficient implementation of that circuit on the given device. Right. When I talk about compatibility, 
of a circuit for a given device, there's, there's a handful of concerns that, that come to mind. Um, the, for instance, when I, when I program in a, a high level quantum circuit, Right, maybe I, I include some uh, custom custom definitions, custom instructions um, that my device wouldn't necessarily know about. So I've got to expand those in terms of the standard gate set. Um, and then once my 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 circuit is expanded in this, the standard gate set, I've got to then re-express it or rewrite it in terms of the the subset of the standard gates that the device understands. So in this case, the the basis gates. Um, and once I've done that. I've got a I've got a choice to make, right? I've got some number of qubits in my uh, circuit. I've got some number of qubits on my device. You know, how am I going to initially pick and place those qubits to from my circuit to put on the device, right? Um, and that's 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 covered by a, a field called uh, initial layout. Um, additionally, as I mentioned before, not all of the qubits are going to have a two qubit gate present between them. Um, uh, so we'll need to have to introduce some process, uh, most often introducing swaps to allow those two qubit gates from the circuit to be executed on the device. Uh, furthermore, the um, this gives us a, a degree of flexibility, right, in that I can now compile across architectures um, and handle device-specific constraints as well. So for the current generation IBM Q hardware, uh, only final measurements are supported, right? So all measurements have to happen at the end of the circuit. Uh, that's a, a constraint that I can enforce in my transpiler and make sure that the equivalent circuit that I'm generating meets those device, con device constraints and, and, uh, and uh, expectations. Uh, for, yeah, for, uh, for optimization, there's uh, a natural way of dividing um, dividing the, the reductions that we'd like to make into logical reductions, ones which um, only deal with sort of still at the, the abstract or, or device uh, agnostic view of the circuit. Um, so these are things like removing uh, gate inverse pairs, right? So if I have a gate and then it's immediately followed by its inverse, right, that's effectively a no-op. I can take that directly out. Um, and likewise, I can, uh, I can take, for example, strings of single qubit gates Right, and I can compact those down to a to an, in in many cases a smaller number of single qubit gates, um, and then on the other hand, so that, those are logical reductions. On the other hand, there are some device specific reductions. So maybe I want to take advantage of the the noise profiles that I have published for my given device, um, and so when I when I make that choice of initial layout, I want to choose not only a strongly connected set of qubits, but ones that have favorable noise profiles. Um, So in Qiskit, most of the time, this is handled uh, behind the scenes under the hood. So many folks who, who run their circuits on quantum, uh, quantum devices today may not necessarily even know that their devices are, are being transpiled. So when we run the function qiskit.execute, this is actually a convenience function, a wrapper around you know, three different stages of, of comp uh, compilation. Uh, the first is the transpiler, uh, as we've talked about so far. The second is the uh, assembler. Uh, that I used in the earlier example. And the assembler is a, is a straight conversion from the quantum circuit object that we hold in Qiskit to a wire format that we can, we can send to the device uh, and that it knows how to process. Uh, and then the last stage in Qiskit.execute is, is backend.run, essentially uh, submitting the job to the, to the device for execution. Now, what we can do is if we're interested in looking at the transpiler process, um, we, can, we can execute only that, right? We can pull that apart um, and, and look at just the input circuits and the output circuits. Um, and so that's what Transpile will do. It'll, it'll give us back an optimized device compatible circuit. And you know, that's, uh, that's the, the, the justification for, for its naming, right? It gives me back an object in the same domain as its input, right? It's a circuit that I can continue to inspect or build upon or, or, or study just as I would the, the circuit that I put in. Um, the transpile function takes a, a, a very broad array of uh, arguments. Uh, most of the time, it tries to pull as many properties as it can from the back end. Um, but these are all uh, all user overridable, right? So if you provide a back end object, it'll try and fetch, for example, the basis gates from the back end. But if you want to compile to a different set of basis gates, then you can supply that as a, as a command line argument. Um, and the goal for the transpiler is for it to be um, you know, modular, configurable, and, and extensible. So what I mean by that is that uh, it should be relatively straightforward for, for users to come and understand, you know, what stages are being uh, assembled in the transpiler uh, and how do they leave from, 
you know, lead along the path from the abstract quantum circuit that you start with down to the, the device executable uh, circuit that you end with. Um, and then it make it easier for users to, to not only understand that process, but also take control of that process to say, oh, in this case, I know that, you know, I, 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 want, to, I want to employ this optimization or I want to specifically sidestep this optimization or I want to make sure that I don't use qubit number four because qubit number four is having a bad day today. Um, these are things that should all be possible through transpile. Um, and in most cases, if you prefer to, to, to keep using, using execute, um, most of the options that you pass to transpile are still available through execute. They're not, not strictly all of them. So if we look back at that initial example where I was, I was generating the, the GHZ state to execute on Vigo, uh, if I go back and first run it through that transpile stage, I get a circuit that looks, looks slightly different. There's a couple more CX gates. My Hadamard has been replaced with a with a U2 gate, and now I've got a barrier before my measurements. But you know, let's let's take a look. Let's let's see if this will run on my device now. I'll go through the same process. I'll assemble it and I'll run it. And now Vigo will say, "Okay, yes, congratulations, job is successfully run." And here are your counts. And I get what you know. What looks like a, a reasonable looking GHE state. Uh, so I mentioned before that the Qiskit transpiler aims to be highly configurable, um, and it is organized in such a way that uh, ideally it's it's understandable and uh, and and uh, in a position that's ready for contributions from the outside. Um, passes are organized in, into analysis and transformation passes, um, but at a high level, you know, most users we expect won't necessarily need to to get into that level of granularity. Um, so we provide a couple of high level options to allow users to say, you know, at a very high level. Hey, I, I just want this to run. I'm not necessarily concerned about you know uh, getting that last you know n percent of performance out of my circuit. Or uh, you know, on the other hand, maybe I, I'm really you know sitting at the bleeding edge of what I think is possible on on this device today. You know, take an extra you know some extra <laughs> a few minutes of, of transpile time um, to try and get me absolutely as much performance out of the devices as possible. Um, and so. You know, as I mentioned, that there's this this path that we walk down from from the user circuit to the device circuit, um, that goes from the stage of you know starting at the outset with an arbitrary gate set, an arbitrary connectivity, and then walking through first some logical reductions and and then some device embedding, uh, down to some physical optimizations and then an output circuit. Um, and in this case, there are, these are a few examples of some of the passes that that will be run in each of these stages. But in most cases, we expect that that users will want to take advantage of a handful of, of sort of pre-configured sets of passes uh, that are uh, labeled by what we call optimization levels. Um, so in this case, you know, right now we have four optimization levels available, and those can be set by uh, through either uh, execute or transpile. Uh, and generally, the idea is that that you know the higher the optimization level, the more time Qiskit is going to spend trying to find a, a more optimal implementation of that circuit. So hopefully higher fidelity, lower depth, um, and usually longer longer classical transpilation time. Um, you know, one one is the default. Uh, it includes a noise-aware dense layout search, uh, some single qubit optimizations, uh, and a direct uh, adjacent inverse optimizations. Uh, optimization level two is, is what we call medium optimization. Uh, we've got a, a Constraint satisfaction layout search, which will try and, and find a perfect layout uh, in cases where it's possible, um, and then a pass that will uh, try and take advantage of commutation relations to try and find gate cancellations, and then optimization level three is what we call sort of the heavy optimizations. Um, it's more time intensive. It'll it'll run through a pass called uh, block collection and resynthesis, um, and the hope there is that it'll it'll provide the the greatest degree of consolidation. Uh, at the cost of greatest runtime, each of the passes, each of the levels contains all of the optimizations from the the lower numbered passes. Um, and optimization level zero is sort of a, a special case compatibility only pass. Um, the intended use case here is for users who are are really concerned with doing characterization experiments. Uh, so, for example, maybe randomized benchmarking or error amplification, where you don't want the transpiler to imply or to apply any optimizations. Um, and so that, that's, uh, that's available for that use case. So if we recall back to the, to the GHZ example on, on Vigo, uh, we started out with, uh, with a two, uh, two, uh, uh, an abstract circuit that had a one single cubic gate and two, two cubic gates. Uh, and when we first transpiled it, we got back a circuit that had uh, one single cubic gate and five two cubic gates. Um, 
So let's see if we can do a little better by bumping up the optimization level. Uh, and we do want to get back, in fact, a, a, a circuit that matches sort of the resource requirements of our little, uh, our initial uh, abstract circuit. So these optimization levels are, are not necessarily uh, predefined in terms of their intent. Uh, they're expected to be you know, rough guidelines um, for you know, how hard the transpiler should work to uh, apply optimization. Um, but they, you know, they're likely to be moving targets. They're likely to change in time as, um, as more optimizations are added to the transpiler. Um, and really, the goal is, is for, for users to have an easy way to try out different selections of passes. Um, so just as a demonstration, I'm going to you know, pull together a handful of random circuits, uh, maybe, say, 10 random circuits at, at 10 different input depths, uh, and then transpile them at the, the different optimization levels and, and see sort of what the outputs look like. All right, so here on the left-hand side, I've plotted for each of the optimization levels uh, how long the transpilation process took per circuit, uh, and on the, the right-hand side, what the, what the overall output depth was. So what we can see is that in, in general, optimization level three will, be, will take more time than two, will take more time than one, will take more time than zero. But again, these are rules that are, are not set in stone, right? In some cases, uh, optimization level one can be slower than optimization level, uh, sorry, optimization level zero can be slower than optimization level one. Uh, maybe optimization level one finds a, a, a some gate compaction that speeds up the rest of the transpilation process. Uh, and likewise, on the depth front, uh, frontier, um, you know, there's an expectation that you know optimization level tends toward lower output depths, um, but it's not guaranteed. There are some cases where running at a higher optimization level may not find necessarily a, a, a shorter depth circuit. Um, so again, the idea is for for users to have easy access to to try these out to see which gives uh, the best results for your particular application or use case. Um, so a question from, from the YouTube channel, why is transpile time a concern? Um, it's a good question. So in some cases, it may not be. right. In, in general, we could say that you know, classical computing resources are, are, are cheaper and more readily available than quantum computing resources. So I'll, I'll spend as much time as I can for you know, trying to get uh, you know every last bit of performance out of my quantum device because I you know it doesn't matter if it if it takes two days to run on my on my laptop or on a, a cluster, right? I'm solving a problem that I that I can't solve um, uh, classically, um, and that's in in general there, there's some degree of truth to that, um, but in, practically it becomes a, a concern if uh, you know if if we're we're trying to to iterate quickly maybe we want to run an experiment and see what our output looks like. Uh, maybe we want to just try something for uh, for you know for curiosity's sake. I want to see okay, well, what's the value of running with uh, um, uh, with this particular set of options? Um, and then, true too, that there are some some algorithms, some some use cases where I want to be able to uh, have a very fast degree of of uh, integration between my my classical processing and my quantum processing. Um, so, for example, something like VQE, and if the stage that goes between every every stage of my my, my VQE iteration takes you know maybe ten to fifteen minutes or, or you know longer than that, well then it's going to take my my VQE to an experiment that I can run you know over the course of uh, maybe a couple minutes to a couple hours to something that's going to take you know days or weeks. So it yeah it's a, it's a it's a practical concern. Um, all right, let's see if there's any more any more questions right now. Uh, if I run an algorithm with iterations, can I use a pre-transpiled circuit? That's a very good question. Yes, you can, and we will uh, we'll get to that a little bit later on. Um, all right, so uh, let's review really quickly some of the some of the techniques that are available for uh, for uh, compatibility and optimization. So these are these are general techniques, um, and there are implementations of each within Qiskit. Uh, so the first concern that, that comes to mind is, is unrolling to the device basis set, right? So each device is only going to have a finite number of, of calibrated gates, right? Because there's a cost and a time to calibrating each gate. So while each uh, each device will have a, a complete, a computationally complete set of basis gates, it may not necessarily have all of the standard gates. Um, so right now, this is done by a pass in the transpiler called the unroller. Um, that looks to uh, a definition property of the, the Qiskit's instruction instance, right? So instructions will have a, a definition property that gives effectively a one-way replacement rule. It says, okay, well, I've got this particular gate, and when you see it in the circuit, you can replace it with these others. 
Um, and so this is how we handle right now things like expanding custom gates, uh, synthesizing unitaries. Um, there's a, a generalization of this uh, of this of this property of this of this approach uh, right now that's being built out in the equivalence library. So the equivalence library is instead of being sort of a, a one directional definition, uh, is a set of um, equivalence relations between the gates and the standard library. Uh, so this allows a sort of a more general set of uh, of replacement rules uh, that can can aid in, in certain cases in finding either a, a better decomposition or one that's more targeted to a particular device architecture. Uh, and so just a, a quick example of what this un unrolling process looks like in practice, right? So if I have a, so for example, just a simple swap gate, uh, but I want to transpile that to, to say the U3CX gates that we saw from Vigo, All right? I can pass that to the, the transpiler and it, it'll know that for a swap gate, the way to implement that over, over CXs is with this three CX sequence, right? Uh, and likewise, I can do the same for, you know, maybe a, a Toffoli gate. Um, and this time, say maybe I'll, I'll decompose it, but to the Cliffords instead. Um, and then maybe when I'm ready to execute it, I'll, I'll transpile it down to, to U3 and CX, right? So this, this basis gates keyword argument is what allows me to specify to the transpiler, you know, what is the set of basis gates that I should use to express this circuit? And by default, this will be pulled from the device, but it's also selectable by this or specifiable by this keyword argument. Uh, another question from the channel, uh, do, do we get impacted in the queue if someone submits a huge transpilation? Uh, so the answer is no. Uh, right now, the transpilation runs uh, locally, runs uh, wherever you run Qiskit. Um, so maybe that's your local laptop, maybe that's your Jupyter instance in IQX, um, but it happens before the job is submitted to the queue. Uh, and one more question, there's a question about uh, uh, the optimization, uh, whether or not these optimizations are efficient. Um, so in general, uh, it depends on the particular optimization that you're looking to apply. Uh, for example, cases like uh, in, in the routing problem where we're looking to insert swaps to get around this, this, uh, this limited connectivity of our, of our device. Um, we know that it's efficient in the number of qubits, but, but not necessarily optimal. Um, and we'll look at that a little bit more later on. Um, so one of the nice things that is enabled by this uh, this ability to enroll to a custom set of, of basis gates is that it gives the opportunity for uh, cross architecture compilation. So if I want to, uh, for instance, uh, compile this this uh, Bernstein Vazirani circuit, um, you know I can I can build it in an abstract form that looks you know just the same that as I, as I would expect it to in uh, in my quantum computing textbook. And then when I want to convert it or compile it down to run on an IBM Q device, all I do is compile it with the specified basis gates and I get uh, an equivalent implementation of that circuit. Uh, but for instance, if I wanted to run it on say uh, an ion trap device, maybe from, from another provider, uh, I can do the same. I can, in this case, specify its basis gates, which look like an RXX, an RY and an RX. And I get back an equivalent implementation uh, that's executable, executable on an ion trap device, right? So the idea is that, we can keep the logic of the program at a relatively high level, allow the optimizations to be specific to the device that we're targeting, and then let the transpiler take take, uh, take care of, uh, of that particular problem. Uh, isn't it NP hard, or question from the channel, isn't it NP hard? Uh, which, which, uh, which, uh, which algorithm are you talking about in this case? Um, I think in general swap mapping, finding the optimal swap mapping may be uh, maybe NP hard. I'm not sure off the top of my head, um, but the algorithms that we use uh, take advantage of some heuristics that that make them efficient to run over over a fixed set of uh, of qubits. Do I choose to take my my you know virtual qubits from my abstract circuit and place them onto the physical qubits of my device circuit? Um, and it's a it seems like a particularly uh, you know, simple problem to 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 describe, uh, but it's an impactful one. It can you know result in in a, a very substantial factor uh, difference in in the final output depth of my transpiled circuit. You know, in some cases, you know, by more than ten x, even between you know what look like very similar or similar and reasonable looking layouts. Um, so in the transpiler, we have a, a couple of of means of of specifying this. If you know in advance what layout you'd like to use, you can specify that by the initial layout keyword argument. Um, 
Additionally, we have three passes um, that uh, that will look at solving this particular problem. There's a trivial layout pass, a dense layout pass, and a noise adaptive layout pass. Uh, the trivial layout pass is is really only useful for characterization experiments. It's the the simple sort of you know one to one mapping between uh, between uh, qubit index in the abstract circuit and qubit index in the device circuit. Um, the dense layout attempts to find sort of what's what's the what's the most densely connected subset of, of device qubits that match the connectivity of the of the circuit, um, and then it, it attempts to take into account the you know the readout error that the qubits will end up on, and then the total uh, two qubit gate error to try and find a, a good subset of the qubits for an initial layout, uh, and then the noise adaptive layout pass. Um, tries to effectively run through the entire the the entirety of the circuit and find a mapping which will minimize the the total accumulated two qubit gate errors and readout errors. Um, and as I mentioned, optimization levels two and three um, will incorporate uh, one of each of these. Uh, and additionally, this this constraint satisfaction solver that attempts to find a, a layout which will require no further no further routing, right? A, a, an output circuit where all of the two qubit gates are ones which are already present on the device. Um, and again, this is an, an element which is configurable. The layout method keyword argument to the transpiler will allow you to specify, in this case, well, I'd like to use uh, level one, but I'd really like to try out you know, and isolate the noise adaptive layout pass uh, instead of the, the dense that's used right now. So you can specify that in that way. Okay, so let's take a look at a, a quick example of the, the layout problem in action. Um, so in this case, we'll take a four qubit GHZ state uh, and we'll try and map it to uh, a, a different IBM Q back in this time, uh, Orenz, um, which has a sort of bent Y, same bent Y configuration that we saw on Vigo. Um, if we run through the, the trivial layout pass, um, when we get back our output circuit, we'll see on the left-hand side, we've sort of notated what the initial layout will look like. So in this case, it's zero to zero, one to one, the qubits sort of end up on the device where they started in the abstract circuit. Uh, and then we run that through the transpiler, we'll get, uh, we'll, the transpiler will have to insert a swap gate here to uh, to make the circuit executable, and so it will. So we end up with, with a, a circuit that ends up with six two qubit gates. Uh, we can do a little bit better if we try it with the, the dense layout pass. Right here, it's gonna find a, a, a circuit that has three two qubit gates, which is right the minimum, that's what we had in our abstract circuit. Uh, we can try the noise adaptive. I believe in this case it finds the same layout that we found um, for in the dense case. Um, and again, these are right. These are these are toy examples. These are trivial examples, so they're not necessarily uh, going to be interesting differences in the uh, in the performance of these uh, passes between these uh, on these simple circuits. Um, but again, you know, depending on your use case, depending on what problem you're trying to solve, you may get you know. Uh, noticeably different performance between each of these. So it's, you know, the advantage is that they're each there to try. Um, and then likewise, as I mentioned, you can specify if, if you know particular that you wanna make sure that, you know, uh, that your Hadamard happens on Q2 for, for whatever reason, maybe it has really low single qubit gate errors, then you can specify the initial layout like this, right? So this says, you know, put qubit zero of my abstract circuit on qubit two of my device circuit and so on. Okay, so the next stage of this, this embedding process uh, is what we call routing, right? So we mentioned that not all qubits are gonna be coupled by a two qubit gate. Um, and so the transpiler is gonna have to go through a process of, of modifying the circuit to make every two qubit gate in the circuit executable in one way or another. Um, usually this is, is done by the, uh, the insertion of, of swap gates. Um, that will essentially take these these gates that are non uh, non these qubits that are non adjacent on the on the device and move them into positions such that they are adjacent. Um, and the stochastic swap look ahead. Uh, the stochastic swap is the default in all the preset uh, pass managers. Um, the basic swap is um, essentially a, it's the the sort of simple greedy algorithm where it looks at the the next executable two qubit gate and just inserts as many swaps as it needs to to make that gate executable uh, executable. Uh, the look-ahead swap, uh, swap mapper attempts to be a little bit uh, a little bit smarter about it and tries to do a, uh, a search to find sort of what's the best swap that will reduce the total cost to implement the, the next several layers of my circuit. Um, and both the look-ahead and stochastic swaps take parameters um, that sort of uh, allow you to, to broaden how, uh, how deep they should search into the circuit to try and find 
the next most optimal swap to, to apply. And as you move to higher optimization levels, those, those will be sort of broadened, uh, broadened for you. So in this case, we can take that same four qubit GHC state and run it through these four different routing methods. Uh, in this case, the basic the basic swap is going to find an implementation of this circuit, you know, which is a which is a valid implementation of the the four qubit GHG state. It's just going to end up with a cost of having it looks like a total of one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve uh, two qubit gates. Uh, the look ahead will do a little bit better. It'll find uh, an implementation that has seven, uh, and the stochastic swap will will find an implementation that has uh, looks like nine. Um, and in this case, you, there's a little bit of, uh, of room for optimization left here, right? There's an initial swap uh, on, on these two qubit gates, even though there's no, uh, no, no input yet for them, right? So, so this would be something that or these, these algorithms are heuristics, right? They try and find um, uh, a best possible out of a, a large number of options. And so they may leave some room for optimization behind. Uh, and so you'd expect that sort of subsequent optimization passes would, would take care of that and you get back down to your, your, your four, uh, four two qubit gate depth. Uh, in the same way that we looked at the available options for optimization, we, uh, for compatibility, we can do the same for optimization. Um, each of the optimization passes are organized in such a way that they apply sort of you know one optimization, one reduction uh, across the circuit, right? So maybe I have a pass that implements uh, cancellation of adjacent CX gates, um, and I run that once over the circuit, and it'll uh, it'll cancel all cases where where CX gates uh, that are uh, cancelable are are removed. Um, and then what we'll do is when we construct a, these preset pass managers, we'll run some set of optimizations in a loop until we get to get to a point where we feel like we've optimized our circuit as much as we can. Usually that amounts to uh, reaching for a, a fixed depth. Um, so just some some quick examples that we'll we'll go through. Uh, of of passes, and there there are more that are available uh, that you can find documented from uh, the Qiskit documentation. Um, but for example, the the CX cancellation pass that I mentioned will will try and find uh, redundant CX gates. Um, optimize one qubit gates will collapse any long strings of single qubit gates down to to shorter numbers. Um, the commutative cancellation pass will look for opportunities where gates commute past each other. In quantum computing, the the frequency. Gates commute with each other, and so there are opportunities for optimization where you know gates may not necessarily be adjacent, may not necessarily be cancelable in the circuit as written. But if these gates commute past another, uh, commute past one another, then we can uh, take that opportunity to to do so if we know that they commute. Uh, and then lastly, the consolidate blocks pass um, is going to try and look for um, groups of of two qubit blocks. Uh, so what what is a block in this case? Um, a block is is a, a subsection of the circuit where there's only going to calculate the effective unitary for that for that block, uh, and then apply a two qubit depth optimal resynthesis. Um, and so we can take a quick look at what each of those looks like in practice. Um, the CX cancellation pass right here. I've, I've built a circuit that has two adjacent CX gates. In this case, you know CX is is self inverse. So when I apply them like this. I'd expect them to be canceled. I'll put a barrier here just for sort of visual clarity. Uh, when I apply them in opposite directions, I wouldn't expect them to be canceled. And when I run that through the CX cancellation pass as part of a, a, a transpile, I see that the, the one on the left-hand side is, is optimized to an identity, and the one on the right-hand side is, is preserved. You know, similarly, as an example of optimized 1Q gates, um, you know, I can construct a circuit that has, you know, an arbitrary string of, of X rotations. Um, Maybe it looks like it's, you know, in this case, 10 uh, or, or 20, 20 single qubit gates. Uh, but by passing this through uh, the one Q optimized one Q gates uh, pass, uh, which in this case requires a, a, solid, a set of basis gates to be specified to know sort of what the output basis should look like, uh, it'll give me back in this case a, an equivalent single qubit implement or single gate implementation of the same uh, same string of single qubit gates. Um, Okay, well, look, there's a couple couple questions in the, the YouTube channel. Uh, in this case, in trapped ion, ion transpiling, would MS gates reduce the RXX? Um, yes, in this case, they are uh, they're the same. So the molmer Sorensen gate in, in Qiskit is just labeled uh, with the gate name of RS, R, RXX. Uh, can you describe in a little more detail how the stochastic swap algorithm works? Uh, yeah, so stochastic swap attempts to break the circuit into layers and then examine sort of what series of swaps will 
uh, will allow for the execution of the most two qubit gates uh, in the next layer. Um, and then it uses a, a stochastic element to try and sort of break ties in, in trying to identify which, which swap gate should be applied next. Um, why wouldn't you always optimize one Q gates? Um, so that's a good question. In, in most cases, you would. Um, but as I mentioned, in some cases, if you're doing, say, for example, a, a characterization experiment where you want to know, uh, say, for example, if I want to do error amplification and I want to know, uh, I want to really try and tightly uh, quantify what the error in my single qubit rotations are. So instead of applying you know, just one and trying to measure a very small error, I'll apply you know, 10 or 20 or 100 of them and try and amplify that error. And that's, that's a process that I don't want the transpiler to, to take away. I don't, I, I don't want to, to compact those to a single, a single, uh, a single rotation. But thanks, these are, these are really great questions. Um, commutative cancellation. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier. This is the, the pass that will attempt to look for a series of gates which commute, which lead to cancellation. So in the example that I've drawn here, right, I've got uh, two Z gates and two X gates, both of which are, 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 are self-inverse, uh, but they're separated by a CX gate. Uh, and so normally, you know, the, the problem would be that in looking for adjacent gates, that I wouldn't see that this Z gate is, is uh, has the opportunity to potentially self-cancel with the, the other ZX gate, or sorry, the other Z gate. Um, but by using the commutation rules, right, I know that a Z gate can commute across the control of a, of a C not gate. Um, and I have the, a freedom to move the Z gate across to, to, to be next to its, its neighboring Z, and those two can commute away, uh, likewise for the, for the X gates on the, the target of the C not gate. Uh, and similarly, you can, do, you can look at instances of the same where I have, say, uh, a C naught between my first and second qubit, and a C naught between my second and first qubit, C naught between my first and second qubit again, right? These two gates will, will be self-inverse, but only if I can commute them through, through this gate. Uh, and so that's what the commutative cancellation pass allows us to do. So we, we end up with only the sort of the interrupting C naught gate being left uh, in each case. Uh, and then I think our last example of the uh, the optimization passes uh, is collect two qubit blocks and consolidate blocks. So this is the case where we're we're going to look for instances of of two qubit blocks that I described a little bit more detail earlier. Uh, in this case, for the example, I'm just going to draw up a random unitary uh, or a series of of random two qubit unitaries, uh, apply them in a row, um, and so in this case, right, each of these each of these two qubit unitaries may have you know zero, one, two, or three uh, two qubit gates. Uh, but this this pass will go through, look for for collections of of blocks that look like this, and then compact them down all into a single unitary, which it can then sort of optimally synthesize. In this case, it finds uh, a synthesis with with three C not gates. Uh, so one of the questions earlier was about the the problem of partial transpilation, right? So if I have a family of circuits that maybe vary vary by by a single parameter, you know, how can I uh, is there a way that I can tell the transpiler to to take advantage of that? Right. So you know, normally the way you construct such circuits is maybe in a loop. You you build a circuit, uh, add your parameterized gate and measure, and then put it in a list of circuits, uh, and then transpile them all together. Uh, and when you do this, the transpiler will sort of actively try and run in parallel across multiple circuits for the sake of classical runtime if it can. Uh, but one alternative way to 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 save the, to solve the same problem is to construct a parameterized gate. So instead of having my loop over circuits, I'll create a, a circuit parameter theta, create one instance of that uh, of that parameterized circuit, which I can then transpile, uh, and then you know bind that one circuit multiple times under the different bind values, uh, and and then it's ready to go to the device, right? So this is a circuit that's that's uh, will be ready to execute on Vigo as soon as it's provided the parameter theta. Um, so hopefully that 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 answers your question. Let me see. I'll scroll back and see if I can see if I can see it. Yeah. A couple more questions in the YouTube channel. Is there a way to know the time taken for an optimization for a particular problem? So in this case, uh, it's not necessarily always uh, possible to know in advance, uh, but it is possible to know after the fact. Um, and I'll show in, in just a second how that's possible. Um, would it be possible to do a CZ-based transpiling instead of the CX one? Uh, in this case, it would not yet, but we're adding support for that uh, in the near term. So 
So you're saying to transpile or tra transpile modularly and use the previously transpiled circuit in a larger circuit. Um, usually, usually not. You you sort of um, unless you are intentionally trying to uh, build up a device circuit. If you take a transpiled circuit and put it inside an abstract circuit, uh, you're not necessarily going to end up with a, a still transpiled circuit. Um, so usually, what you'd want to do is build it up in a parameterized way, um, and then transpile over that over, over those sort of parameters, and then you can apply that binding, and then you can you can transpile the bound circuit again in case there's some optimizations that were missed that were dependent on maybe the, what the value of those parameters were. Um, okay. Um, so a couple more slides to get to, and these are these are sort of tips and tricks for using the tr the transpiler in particular use cases. Um, so I mentioned in a couple of places that if you're you're running characterization experiments, there are cases where you may not want the the transpiler to make certain optimizations, and usually optimization level zero is is going to be the go-to in, in those cases. Um, by default, there's no included optimization passes. You get a you get to specify the layout uh, in advance, and if the if the layout that that is chosen results in a, a routed circuit, so that all 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 two qubit gates are adjacent. Then the routing stage of the transpiler won't won't run. Even if the transpiler maybe thinks that there is a, a better routing for that particular circuit, if the circuit is already routed, then the transpiler will will not uh, further route it. So that's that's meant here. What's what's specified by this ability to pre-route that you can specify uh, exactly what qubits you want the the circuit to run on, and the the transpiler will respect that. Um, the other uh, other tool that you have in this in this context is the barrier. So barriers are those sort of vertical bars that you saw in the earlier circuits. Um, and they specify to the transpiler uh, a, a barrier which should not be sort of optimized across. If I have you know two single qubit gates that are separated by a barrier, then the transpiler won't look across that barrier to make any optimizations. Um, and yeah, one additional one additional uh, additionally useful uh, thing to know about is that for the parts of the transpiler that are are randomized, like for example the stochastic swap mapper. Um, you you may want to or maybe desirable to to specify uh, a seed so that you can say get a reproducible set of output like if you want to run some uh, some uh, transpilations for a paper you want to make sure that the results aren't going to change every time you run then you can specify a seed transpiler and that will that will make those sec those segments of the transpiler uh, deterministic. Uh, Quick question from the YouTube channel: Why did you have ancilla qubits in the circuit that you showed? So in this case, when the when the circuit is transpiled for the device, the first stage that happens is an expansion of that circuit to map the number of match the number of qubits on the device, right? So in this case, it'll be for a, a three qubit uh, abstract circuit on a five qubit device. The output circuit of the transpiler will have you know three utilized uh, uh, device qubits and two ancilla qubits. Uh, and in some stages of the transpiler, there may be opportunities to make advantage of, to take advantage of those ancilla qubits, maybe by uh, swapping through them, or maybe using a, a shorter decomposition of a of a logical gate. Um, but yeah, so so in the, the examples we showed, there wasn't any opportunity to take a, a advantage of those ancilla, so they sort of just sat there. Uh, but that's that's their purpose. Um, all right, and one more uh, note about when we transpile for a simulator. Uh, simulators are a little bit different than devices, obviously, uh, but most notably in that they they have a, a much broader degree, a much broader number of basis gates, uh, and just the reason, the rationale there is that it allows for for more efficient simulation in a handful of cases, right? Like if I have a unitary gate, uh, I can I can when I'm when I'm transpiling to a simulator, if the backend that's provided is a simulator, the transpiler will try and optimize for that simulator, which in general is what you want. It'll it'll result in the shortest possible uh, simulation times. Uh, the only caveat is that if you're trying to perform a noise accurate simulation, um, then you want to make sure that you either transpile with the backend first using the the Qiskit transpile function to get back the transpiled version of that circuit for the backend that you're looking with, or you can specify to the executor transpile function where it should pull the basis gates coupling map and backend properties from. And just make sure that those correspond to the to the backend that you're trying to simulate. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes uh, left, so I'm going to try really quickly to go through some of the tooling that we have available for users to understand what the what's going on during the process of transpilation, what the transpiler is is doing, what it's thinking about, maybe why it made the decisions that it did. Um, and the first of this is is the ability to inspect the the output circuit. So uh, we mentioned that 
uh, for if you run uh, a circuit through uh, qiskit.transpile, you'll get back the transpiled circuit. But if you do use execute, or, or maybe you want to go back and look to see what uh, what my version of the, the transpiled circuit looked like when it reached the device, um, you can use a tool called the disassembler uh, or the just the disassemble function. And what that'll do is that'll that'll unpack the set of transpiled circuits from, from the device, from the job. Uh, and then you can look at those and inspect those sort of, and that's this is the output that that, that came out of the transpiler. And this will be the, the set of gates and circuits that were executed on the device. Uh, additionally, the transpiler has a, a built-in logging mechanism. Right? So this would be how, um, how you'd get access to uh, how how long each optimization or how long each pass ran for during the course of your transpile. So again, this is not something you can necessarily know beforehand. Uh, but while you're running, if you use the, the normal Python uh, logging mechanism, um, if you set a log level of info, then you'll get a, a, a log output, including what passes ran and how long they ran for. Um, and in some some passes uh, include uh, uh, a little bit more involved uh, debugging output if you specify a, a lower debug uh, debug level. Um, so then the next sort of most uh, most involved uh, ability to uh, interact with the the transpiler as it running as it's running is the ability to attach uh, an arbitrary callback to be running between passes. Right, so just like you may be familiar with from from some of the functions in say numerical computing. Uh, I can specify a function that that takes a pass. Uh, the circuit representation this time not as a not as a quantum circuit object, but as a DAG circuit. Um, the duration that the the pass ran for, what the property set looked like, uh, and where it's set in my transpile pipeline. Uh, and then I can sort of pause the transpile as it's going and, and do some inspection. I can um, I can maybe uh, query the circuit as to to what its properties are. I can look to see what the values are in the property set. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to try and grab all the transformation passes and, and draw my circuit. So I can see sort of how my circuit transforms at the bottom from this uh, this abstract GAZ circuit and pass by pass looks a little bit more like something that's that's ready to be executed on the device. Right? Here's the insertion of the swaps by the swap mapper. Here's where they're decomposed into CX. Um, here's where these two CX gates are collapsed uh, down to an identity. And then at the end, I end up with something that looks like my my, my device circuit. Um, and lastly, even though we're, we're, we're running out of time, uh, the transpiler is based on a, a, a concept called the pass manager that allows a reasonable degree of sophistication in terms of how these uh, passes are orchestrated um, and in what cases they're, they're executed. Um, there's a lot of flexibility here in terms of, of how you can control what passes run and under what contexts. Um, that for folks who are interested, there's a there's a tutorial available and they're they're well documented. Um, but I think for for most users, the ability to inspect them to to know for the preset pass managers, sort of what do they look like, uh, is available. So if I look at say the level zero pass manager, I can look and see okay from stage to stage, you know what pass is going to be run, what inputs does it take, um, you know how will things be ordered, where where will I have conditional stages like okay well here's my Here's my here's my routing stage, and it's conditional on whether or not my my circuit is already mapped, right? So that's that's how I'll know what's going to happen in this case, and and it, it's a good way for getting a relative comparison of what the different pass managers look like. In this case, right, level three looks fairly similar to level one, except it has this big do while loop at the end with all these optimization passes, right? So this is. And that brings us uh, right to the end of, of of what I was hoping to cover today. Um, hopefully, everybody uh, found something something new about the the process of transpiling circuits and and Qiskit's transpiler. Um, in general, the takeaways is that right the the circuits that execute on the device uh, will in general not be the same as as the ones that you program in Qiskit unless you try uh, to make sure that that's the case. Um, in most cases, there will be some some optimization processes that go on, but it's important to know sort of when the circuits will be. Uh, will be of, of, of shorter depth and when they may be potentially of, of longer depth. Uh, Qiskit, we, we uh, include a set of optimization passes and uh, pre-built pass managers that you can use uh, uh, fairly readily to see which will give you the best performance for your application on your particular device. Uh, and then we really do encourage folks to, to try these out to, to see which gives them uh, you know, their, their best match of maybe classical runtime and device performance or you know, best matches their application for, for performance. Uh, and so with that, I, I hope uh, everyone you know found this uh, a worthwhile and enjoyable experience. Um, 
and I'll, I'll check the the channel one more time to see if there's any any last uh, sneaking in questions. Ah uh, yes, and so uh, the slides will are they're not right now, but they will be posted into the the description of the YouTube video, um, sometime sometime shortly. Um, okay, there's a couple questions coming in now. I'll try and try and pick one or two to answer. Um, okay, uh, what are your or IBM's thoughts about the gate-based model? Uh, it's not a good model to work from during this NISC era, and that we should be working with a cycles-based model. Uh, a model exposes more of the details of coupling, crosstalk, heavy versus light operations to the developer. Um, so I'll, I'll share my opinion on this. So in, in Qiskit, we do have something, I think when you say a cycles-based model, I think you're you're describing something a little bit closer to um, uh, maybe what's, what's, uh, what's available through Qiskit Pulse, where you can define your experiments a little bit closer to the hardware. Um, now, in terms of, of whether or not you're, oh, in this case, maybe you mean uh, exposing a cost associated with each gate. Um, so for exposing the cost associated with each gate, um, this is something that's available that you you are, you know, in Qiskit, you have access to all the information that, that allows you to perform these, these sorts of calculations. And you have the opportunity to sort of hand optimize or, or hand compile your circuit based on what you know about the gate times from, uh, and gate errors from the device, right? These are all metrics that we, that we uh, calibrate for and publish along with the devices. Um, so this is a, a method of programming that is, is possible through Qiskit. Um, now, and, it, and, it's, and it's one that may be necessary for sort of near-term demonstrations, right? If, if we're looking to do something that's right on the edge of what's practically possible with the devices that we have today, you know, these are optimizations that we're going to be, you know, these are, you know, small epsilons that we're going to be looking to, to take advantage of. Um, and so I think that this is, it's important that this is something that we have the opportunity to do. Um, but I think in general, in the long term, we're looking to build up more, uh, you know, more sophisticated algorithms, more sophisticated use cases. Uh, this is the this is the state of development that we'll we'll be looking to work in. Um, in general, we want the the develop the applications developer to be focused on applications development, and you know, the optimization developer to be able to focus on optimizations and and to have a, a method of collaboration like this that's provided in the transpiler. I think. Uh, will provide a, a meaningful path forward for for the uh, for the field. Uh, so pass managers like optimization flow with certain sequential optimizations. Um, yes, to a degree. So uh, in general, for the pass manager, all of the steps will be executed sequentially. Um, but when they're executed and whether or not they're included can all be toggled depending on the state of the circuit and the device that's being targeted. So like a good example is uh, if I have a, a device like a, a simulator that has say all to all connectivity, right? There's, I have the access to, to two qubit gates between every qubit in my circuit, right? Then the pass manager that you construct can have a field that says, well, if my, if my device is, is all to all connected or my circuit is already, is already routed, then don't run the routing stage. And so that's that's sort of what we have in the pre uh, So if the transpiler is run on the simulator, it does not worry about connectivity. If it does, we or it does if we provide an architecture, how is it taken into account? So for the uh, simulator, if the transpiler is inspecting the simulator as it's back end directly, um, then yes, it, it, that's right. It assumes all to all connectivity. Um, but if we provide a backend, it, it reads from the, the coupling map of that backend and says, okay, well, in the output circuit that I generate, I'm only going to allow myself to, to utilize the two qubit gates that are specified in that coupling map. Um, so you would go through that routing stage and you would get those swap circuits. All right, looks like that, that more or less wraps it up for all the questions. Uh, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, thanks for all the comments in the, the YouTube channel. It was a uh, it was a uh, very enjoyable talking with uh, with all of you. Uh, I hope you guys found this all uh, informative and, and and worthwhile. And uh, and yeah, we'll uh, I'll uh, <laughs> hopefully see you all again on uh, another Kiskit Circuit Sessions uh, uh, live stream.